As we start the next module, you will see that we are going to be talking about solutions. And solutions are really important because almost every reaction that we see in chemistry is going to take place in solution. The first thing we need to talk about when we start talking about solutions is to, to really discuss how much of each component is present within that solution. Now, these are things that you should have covered in your first year class. Um, so it should be reviewed this first section, but you need to make sure that you understand um, molarity, molality, and mole fractions. So we'll go over those quickly um, just to review, make sure you have those back under your belt again. We're going to be doing quite a few um, calculations with these things, so you want to make sure that, um, that these things are really easy for you. Molarity um, is usually uh, abbreviated with a capital M. And it is calculated by taking the moles of the solute, remember that's the thing that is dissolved, um, into um, the liters of solution. Now it's not liters of the solvent, it's liters of solution. So it's how much you end up with at the end, all right? Molality, on the other hand, is the moles of solute per kilograms of solvent. So here I'm looking at, let's say I'm gonna dissolve salt in water, so um, it would be the moles of salt divided by the number of kilograms of water. And that is abbreviated with a little m, whereas when I'm going to calculate molarity of the same solution, it would be the moles of salt divided by the liters of how many, so, how, how many liters of solution I actually end up with. So this is solution and this is solvent. So you want to make sure that you don't get those two things confused. Okay, the other quantity that you need to be aware of is mole fraction. And when he defines this in the, in the text part of the chapter, he defines it as moles of solute divided by the moles of solute plus the moles of solvent. Okay, however, mole fraction can also be used to express uh, the moles of solvent divided by the moles of solute plus the moles of solvent, okay? So basically what, you're, what we're looking at here is the total number of moles of everything that are present on the bottom, and then on the top, we're either looking at the moles of solvent or the moles of solute. Um, I think we may have done this in uh, our, the first year class where we were talking about the mole fraction of um, gaseous mixtures. It's also used there too. And so in um, some mixtures, you may have uh, a whole lot of different components. So you could have three or four mole fractions to talk about the same solution. Here, um, we just simplify this because we're just talking about a very simple solution where we have one solute and one solvent, okay? So since this is a fraction, if you've done this right, if you add the mole fraction of the solute and the mole fraction of the solvent together, that should add up to one because all fractions, um, if you take, you have just one solution, you take the fraction of everything that's there, it should add up to one and make the whole. Now, if we were talking about salt, this would be delineated by saying, um, the mole fraction, you usually call that X, and then as a um, subscript, you put the mole fraction of what you're talking about. So the mole fraction of NaCl in this particular case, or the mole fraction of the water. And so if I just have a salt water solution, again, if I take the mole fraction of the salt plus the mole fraction of the water, I should end up with one there, okay? So let's work a couple of examples, or work an example here and make sure that this is clear. Um, this is example 5.1. A chemist takes 5.01 grams of sodium chloride and dissolves it in 112.1 grams of water. Uh, the total volume of the resulting solution is 113.5 milliliters. Calculate the concentration of sodium chloride in molarity, molality, and mole fraction. Well, I started out with grams of NaCl, and everything um, that is up here is going to require moles of NaCl. So obviously, the first thing I've got to do is I've got to convert grams to moles. So I'm going to take 5.01 grams of NaCl, and in one mole, there are 58.5 grams. And so if I divide that out, that is going to give me 0 0.0856 moles 
of NaCl, okay? Now, if I want to do molarity, that's moles of solute per liters of solution. So the molarity is going to be the 0 0.856 moles of NaCl over liters of solution. They said the final volume is 113.5 milliliters. So if I convert that to liters, it's going to be 0.1135 liters. And so then if you divide that out, you're going to end up with 0 0.754 molar in ACL. Three significant figures. Okay. Now, if you're going to calculate mol uh, molality, molality is the kilograms of solvent. So my molality is going to be 0. Point, whoops, that was kind of a crazy zero. 0. 0.856 moles over... Um, I was told that I had 112.1 grams of water, so I'm going to convert that to kilograms. So it's going to be 0.1121 kilograms of solvent. So when you divide that out, you're going to end up with 0 0.764 molal in ACL. Okay, you can see the numbers are similar, but they're not exactly the same. And then finally, if I want to do mole fraction, um, I'm also going to have to know how many moles of the solvent I have. I know that I have 112.1 grams of water, so I'm going to have to convert that to moles. In one mole, there are 18 grams of water. And so when I convert that, that's going to give me 6.28 moles of water. Okay? Now... To do mole fraction, if I want the mole fraction of NaCl, um, I'm going to take the moles of NaCl, 0 0.0856 moles there, and then I've got to put the total number of moles on the bottom, 0 0.0856 plus 6.28 moles. Now, this is where you have to be careful with your significant figures because you've got addition on the bottom and then you're dividing it. So, um, you're, you can only take the number of significant digits out to the hundredths place because we're adding on the bottom. And so, on the bottom, that's going to be um, 6.32 on the bottom with the 0 0.0856 moles on the top. And all of those moles are going to cancel out. And so that's going to give me a mole fraction of the NaCl of 0 0.0135, okay? This problem did not ask me for the mole fraction of water, but I could calculate it just simply by substituting the 6.32 up here on the top. And then whatever I get for the mole fraction of water should add to the mole fraction of NaCl, and it should add up to 1. If it doesn't, I mess something up someplace. You need to go back and fix it. Okay. So those are um, the calculations that you're going to be doing in this first section. You may have noticed that the lesson plans for this section are quite a bit longer than normal. Um, that is because I've added several things to this chapter um, that I think uh, you need to have a good understanding about, especially if you're going to go on to college chemistry. Um, the first thing um, that you're going to be doing is making sure that you know how to prepare a stock solution. Um, a stock solution is, this, is the solution that we use in the lab um, that we're going to use to do other reactions with or do other things with. And so this stock solution um, is something that obviously you're going to have to measure carefully so that you know what you're doing. And you can either prepare a stock solution from a solid or you can prepare it from um, another liquid. To prepare a, a stock solution um, in an accurate fashion, we are going to use something called a volumetric flask. Now, obviously, since um, um, you guys are all homeschooled, we don't have access to that kind of glassware. In fact, volumetric flasks are very, very expensive, and um, it's it's not something that you know one individual family could could be able to purchase. So. That doesn't mean that I don't want you still to understand how to use those things. Okay, so a volumetric flask looks like this. Um, excuse my, my drawing, I'll do the best job that I can here. But a volumetric flask has a very, very long neck on it. And then it has kind of a rounded 
um, bottom and the bottom is flat so that it will sit on the counter. And then there is a line etched someplace on the neck. And I've seen volumetric flasks where the line is etched really low and others where it's etched up really high. So there's a line etched on the neck someplace. Volumetric flasks come in all different sizes. You may find them as small as 10 milliliters. You may, you're gonna find them up as big as a liter. Um, I've not seen any bigger than a liter, but they, there may be some in some labs. So um, you're gonna be able to measure this very, very accurately. So let's assume that um, I was trying to prepare uh, a solution of silver nitrate or magnesium sulfate or whatever it was I'm gonna, I was going to, um, to prepare. I'm gonna calculate the number of grams of solid that I will need. I'll put the solid down in the bottom of the container and then I'm gonna add water up to about the top of where the, the rounded portion is. You're gonna shake it really good until it dissolves really well and then you're gonna add water very carefully up the neck until the meniscus just sits, the bottom of the meniscus just sits at that line, just like when you're measuring the volume in a graduated cylinder, okay? Um, you know that you have to read the bottom of the meniscus there, and that is how carefully these have been calibrated so that you can get a really, really accurate measurement um, in your volumetric flask. Um, I have, giving you um, a, a, a lab that you're actually gonna do where you're going to be using um, an online simulation to look at um, how you're going to be using the volumetric flask. So uh, once you go through that several times, I think, it will, think you'll be pretty comfortable with the use of a volumetric flask. Now, there are some types of stock solutions that we can't start with the solid, we actually have to start with another liquid. And concentrated acids are one of those. Um, as an example, sulfuric acid, um, it can be pretty nasty stuff in the concentrated form, but they sell sulfuric acid uh, at about 18 molar. It's highly, highly um, corrosive stuff. You don't want to get it on your skin, um, but that is generally the way that it's purchased. And then when you use it in the lab, then you've got to dilute that. Um, we did talk about this particular dilution equation in first year chemistry, and this equation that I'm going to show you will probably look familiar, but it's also one that students tend to really um, mess up because they want to use it for other things besides dilution, and so you have to be really careful. This is the one where you take um, the molarity of the first solution times the volume of the first solution is going to equal of the molarity of the second times the volume of the second. So whatever you're starting with, um, you multiply the molarity and the volume together. And when I multiply molarity and volume together, what's that give me? Well, if you think about that, molarity is moles per liter. And if I multiply by liters, I'm going to end up with moles. And so that should make sense to you because whatever is dissolved in that liquid, if all you do is add more liquid to it, if I just add more water, the same number of moles of solutes there is just been diluted. So um, I've got moles when I start is gonna, be, is gonna be equal to moles when I finish. So let's say, I forgot my eraser. Let's say that I'm going to start with um, 18 molar sulfuric acid. That's, that's the, the, what I have. But what I need for my experiment is I need uh, 250 milliliters of one molar H2SO4 instead. Okay, so how am I going to figure out how much to use when I go to dilute this? Well, that's where this dilution equation comes into, comes into play. So initially, I'm starting with 18 molar HCl, and I need to know how much of that, what volume am I gonna need in order to end up with one molar HCl, and I want 250 milliliters or 0 0.250 liters of that. So if I multiply these two together and divide it by 18, you will see that I will end up with 0.014 liters of the concentrated sulfuric acid, and then I will dilute that um, until I have a final volume of uh, 250 milliliters, okay? 
So I'll take 14 milliliters. I put that in my volumetric flask and then I'll fill it up with water. Now there is one thing that I will go ahead and mention and um, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll go ahead and say it. You may not remember it long-term because you're not really gonna have any experience doing it, but there's a saying that chemists use that goes like this. It says, do what you oughta, add acid to water. And so what a lot of times what happens is when you dilute these, they can produce an awful lot of heat. So in a situation where I'm diluting a concentrated acid, I'm gonna already have quite a bit of water in the bottom of this. Then I'm gonna add my 14 milliliters of concentrated acid and then shake it up and then I'll fill it up the rest of the way with water. So um, if you're starting with a solid, it's fine to put it in the volumetric flask by itself. If you're gonna start with a concentrated acid, normally you wanna put um, quite a bit of water in there first and add your acid to the water. Okay, so uh, your first additional lab is gonna be on preparing stock solutions, making sure you understand how to prepare stock solutions. Um, the second additional lab that you're going to be doing is, again, going to be using an online simulation with Beer's Law. Um, we're not going to be doing a lot of calculations with Beer's Law, but it's the idea behind Beer's Law that I want you to understand. Um, you are already aware that some solutions, um, the solvents, or I'm sorry, the solutes in them are going to give them some, some pretty bright colors. And you may need to determine the concentration of an unknown solution. And you can use that uh, using what's called a spectrometer or a spectrophotometer. Um, they're called both things. And you're gonna use Beer's Law, which basically says, if I take a, a tube um, and it contains some of this colored solution, and then I shine a light through it, the amount of light that's absorbed by that solution is directly um, associated with what the concentration of that solution is. And as you can probably imagine, um, when, a, when a, a solution is a really, really dark color, not a whole lot of light gets through. And so a, an, a piece of equipment like the spectrometer is going to measure how much light is absorbed and how much light actually gets through and then that will help you determine what the concentration of that solution is. And so the other, the second lab that I gave you is going to help you explore some of those ideas. He doesn't talk about it in the book, probably again, because this book was written for students who are studying um, at home and don't have access to a lab, so he didn't mention it. But it, it, it's a very important um, thing that's used in labs, and so I wanted you to have some exposure to that. So those two labs you'll be doing once you finish um, this section, and I hope you enjoy doing those and, and enjoy learning about some things that you may not actually be able to see until you take chemistry in college.